Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hello, Alicia. How are you today? I am doing phenomenally well, Michael, now that I'm talking to you. <laughs> That's a very good answer. <laughs> Not many people have answered it in that way. <laughs> and I, we both have double barreled surnames. Me with De Groot, you with Butler Pierre. And Correct. do you pronounce it Pierre and the French way? Yes, or yes indeed, I do. I'm originally from Louisiana, the state of Louisiana in the U.S., which for your listeners, it was actually colonized by the French. So I ah. meet a lot of people from the state of Louisiana. We have French names, many of us. Great. I didn't know that. So thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. That's You're fantastic. Welcome. Oh, I love it. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your story because I've read your profile and your LinkedIn and you have done so much and you're doing <laughs> a ton. I don't know how you get time for it. So I'm hoping <laughs> I'm hoping to find out. And so thank you for squeezing me in into your busy day, which I'm sure it is. And um, so I, I start the interview always with one really open question and you can answer it in any which way you would prefer and that is so alicia please share us your story and how you got to where you are today my story gosh michael okay without running the risk of boring your listeners to tears i will give a i will give a shortened version of my story my story begins in as i explained a few minutes ago in the state of Louisiana, Baton Rouge to be exact, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. That's where I was born and raised. And I grew up uh, in a you know home with both parents. My mother was a health inspector. So she would actually go and inspect different restaurants, any place that served food to the general public. Right. And so I'm sure you can imagine, Michael, there were many, many, many stories that we would hear um, of places yeah. to not go and eat. <laughs> but wow. suffice it to say, my mother had an eagle's eye. Great. She could spot that lady can spot dirt from a mile away. I mean, it's 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 in incredible. My dad had a background in the military. He was in the Air Force. But by the time I was born, my father was actually working at Exxon. Right. Uh, the, the, the gas company and growing up. So I have this father who was in the military, a mother mm. who's a health inspector with a, a strong science background. So I, I didn't realize it growing up, obviously, but you know how sometimes you're an adult and you kind of reflect on your childhood and you, you realize how certain things have shaped who you are as a person today. Yeah. And those just having them as parents, absolutely had a huge impact on how my sister and I both came out. <laughs> I eventually <laughs> would become a, a chemical engineer and she is a radiologist. She's a, a medical doctor. So that's, it's no surprise that we ended up choosing the professions that we, we chose. Yeah. Something else that I think is that's worth pointing out, Michael, growing up where I did, when people think of the U S I know sometimes it's, it's, kind of easy to paint us with a, a broad stroke. And that goes for any country, but there are some very distinct differences about the state of Louisiana in comparison to the rest of the U.S. Right. It's almost like being in the Caribbean in the sense that there's there's such a huge mixture of, of different ethnicities uh, in, right. in my state. There's We have our own subcultures. Also, we have our own food. We even have our own, well, we say Creole, but it's kind yes. of like a broken French, right? So there are certain parts of the state. My grandfather, for example, that was his first language. It wasn't English. And so I think that surprises a lot of people yeah. when they hear that about the U.S. Like, what do you mean? Yes. So Louisiana is very different. Um, again, we have our own cuisine, our own music, culturally just incredibly different. And in fact, as of this recording, next month in the month of February, we'll be celebrating Mardi Gras, which is yeah. in many ways, Michael, bigger than Christmas. I mean, yeah. 
it is a huge deal <laughs> where I'm from. Yeah. So, so that's just, that just kind of gives you an example of the, the environment, I guess you could say that I grew up in one that's very festive, one where people might be down, but they're not out. We're always going to find the humor in a situation, no matter how serious it might be. I think a lot of people saw that if they can remember back when Hurricane Katrina happened in 2005, yeah. um, as horrible and devastating as it was, people still found a way to have that sense of humor. Mm. So that's that's the, the the environment that I grew up in. And another very interesting thing about Louisiana is, and I'll speak uh, for Southern Louisiana in particular, I can't really speak for the Northern part of the state. It's still very Catholic. So right. I grew up, I went to Catholic school from the moment I was in kindergarten up to eighth grade. Yeah. So- <clears throat> For example, uh, one of the things that I credit the nuns with is my excellent penmanship. <laughs> but also, I think going to school in that kind of an environment, it made me appreciate how methodical things were. Yeah. There was a process for the way we did a lot of things. And again, that shaped me, although I didn't realize it at the time. No, but looking back and reflecting on my childhood, it it definitely, it absolutely played a major role in in something as simple as how I how I write and take notes and how I think about certain things. Yeah. So fast forward, once I get through the eighth grade, I then went to what we call here in the States, we refer to it as a magnet high school. And what that really means, Michael, is it's it's college preparatory. So it's not a regular, it's not a private school. Right. It's not a public school, but it's somewhere in between where sure. students have to take certain tests. You have to maintain a certain grade point average to stay at the school. And so that's that's where I went. And I had a, a very high aptitude for writing. So yeah. I thought I wanted to eventually pursue a career in journalism. Right. So I joined the I joined the newspaper and I absolutely hated it. Wow. I hated it. <laughs> and I, I didn't like it. Be I didn't like it, Michael, because of what it took to, quote unquote, get a good story. Right. I didn't like that part of it. And, mm. and I've since come to understand that there's so many different facets to journalism, especially today in, in 2023. There's so many different ways that you can showcase your writing skills, whether it be in a book, a blog post. Uh, we have social media now where you have the the opportunity at times to write longer form posts and things like that. But yeah. at the time, working on the school newspaper, it just seemed a little grimy and kind of tabloidish. Yeah, uh, I know you're in the UK, kind of along the lines of the sun. <laughs> never heard of it. Yeah, never heard of the sun. <laughs> I know that yellow ball in the sky that we don't see very often, but <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So I'm all familiar with Rupert Murdoch and, and <laughs> not at all, not at all. Oh yeah. Um, so that's what I thought it was. And I said, you know what, as much as I love literature and the arts and reading, yeah, I didn't want to pursue that as a career. And it turns out, I also discovered around the time when I was 16 that I also had an aptitude for chemistry. I absolutely loved it. I was so good at it. It came so natural to me. And by the time I was in my last year of high school, where I'm literally getting ready to, to I'm filling out all of these applications to attend university. And my teacher, who was my high school chemistry teacher, who actually happened to be Ukrainian, interestingly oh, wow. enough. Yeah. Yes, Mrs. Kablis. Shout out to Mrs. Kablis. And she took a she took a keen interest in my development beyond high school. Right. And I have to credit her with with my decision to pursue a degree in chemical engineering. Because she started at, to ask me, have you thought about what you want to study when you go to university? And I said, well, chemistry. Mm. And she said, well, you know, think about this. You would have to go all the way up to the PhD level 
before you start to make real money as a scientist. But if you pursued chemical engineering, you could go to school for four or five years and then you come out and you're making great money. And so money was my motivating factor, <laughs> <Yeah>. Michael. <laughs> Show me the money, right? <laughs> Isn't that the same for everyone? Yes. It's a massive motivator. You know, isn't I, it? Yeah. Indeed it is. Indeed it is. I and I I will not um I will not ever say that it isn't. OK, yeah. because it, yeah. it it absolutely is. And and truthfully, that was that was the motivation. And so I eventually attended school, attended university, Louisiana State University, to be exact. And it was hard. It was the toughest one of the toughest things I've ever done in my life. Wow. And I've, you know, I remember that we would often be told that of the engineering disciplines, chemical engineering is, is one of the toughest. So it was, yeah. it was a real challenge, but I'll, I'll share this with you, Michael. Not only did it teach me tenacity, perseverance, stick to it It also taught me discipline Sure. because when you are a student, you're on your own. Mom and dad aren't around to make sure no. that you get up every day and you go to your classes and and that you you're, you're doing your homework and and all of your assignments and you are literally on your own mm. and it's up to you. You're going to sink or swim. And when I think about those tenets, that has carried through with me to this very day. No matter what I do, whether it's running a business or doing something that's more on the personal side. Having that discipline goes such a long way. Wow. Yeah. And eventually I graduated. My very first job was at another company that you may not have ever heard of, Monsanto. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening to one of your episodes and you were interviewing someone and she was talking about her journey from going from being a vegetarian to a vegan. And she mentioned a documentary called Forks Over Knives. And yeah. what's interesting, when I worked at Monsanto, because it was such a large company, I was in a silo. I didn't know what was going on no. at, at, overall at, at the company. It wasn't yeah. until I left that I started to really understand the business that they were in. And it was as yeah. a result of watching documentaries like Forks Over Knives and Super Size Me and all those kinds of uh, food related documentaries. Yeah. And it didn't take me long, Michael, to realize corporate America was not for me. I just wasn't cut out for it. All the bureaucracy, being mm. in a silo, not understanding the outside or external market factors that were impacting our day-to-day -day production schedules. Yeah. And I'll just say this really quickly as I start to wrap up this story. When I was working at Monsanto, I'll never forget this. And I love sharing this story. I remember, so we worked in the, the, the overall plant that I worked in where we, yeah. we made Roundup. We made Roundup at this particular facility. That's a weed and killer, right? That is the weed killer. That is absolutely yeah. correct. Um, this was before they really started to get into the genetically modified seeds yeah. business and genetically engineered. So I was on the Roundup side of the business. And, and the, the overall plant was kind of segmented into different, what they called business units. Yes. Each business unit had its own accountant that was assigned to it. And every month that accountant would come over and talk to us engineers. And I remember they'd have these really thick reports. Do you remember those? Do you remember what printer paper used to look like, Michael? Yes. It was, and it had the perforated edges on yes. the side. Yeah. Oh, and it yeah. took forever. It seemed like it took an hour just to print one page. That's right. <laughs> I do. I remember it well. Yeah. <laughs> so she'd bring over I think her name was, oh gosh, I can't remember her name, but, but anyway, I remember she would bring these really thick printouts, reports, and it was as though she was speaking Greek, you know, mm -hmm. assets and liabilities and equity and cash flow. And I didn't know what any of that stuff meant, mm. but I knew enough to know that 
whatever was going on outside in the world and the marketplace, that was dictating supply and demand. And that was impacting our production, whether we yeah. ran at full production or we may be asked to cut back by 50% or we may be asked to shut down altogether. And it just yeah. didn't make sense. It seemed erratic. It seemed like everyone was going mad. <laughs> but it was at that moment when I realized I don't understand business. Right. I don't have a clue about the business. I know the technical things like how yeah. to make, you know, how to make the widget, but I don't know the business of the widget itself. Mm. And I decided to go back to business school. So I was working full time during the day, going to school at night and 9-11 happened in the U.S. Oh. Yeah. And it changed everything. And one of the things I realized was that I needed I needed to find a new job mm. because it was becoming more and more difficult to juggle the job and going to school. Yeah. And I really wanted to to understand business. So I ended up finding meeting my next employer. He owned his own engineering consulting firm. Right. And one thing led to another. I ended up leaving Monsanto. I started working for this much, much, much smaller family owned mm. business. And that is what opened my eyes to small businesses, right. having that direct access to entrepreneurs, not getting caught up in the bureaucracy. There was no corporate ladder to climb. It was a family owned business. Yeah. So unless you had part of the bloodline, chances are you weren't going to <laughs> become an owner in the company. No. But it was great, Michael, because as I was going to school at night and learning these different theories and concepts, business concepts, I could directly apply it to things I was working on at my job. Brilliant. And yeah. uh, to start to round out this story of what's led me to, to being an entrepreneur today, I worked there for maybe another three, three and a half years and had this feeling one day that I needed to get, I was living in New Orleans, Louisiana at this time, Right. had this feeling, Michael, I needed to get out quick, fast and in a hurry. It didn't make sense. I couldn't even really explain it, but it was this nudging, edging, intuitive gut feeling. You have mm. to get out and you need to get out now. I graduated from business school in December, 2004. The following January, I put my house up for sale. And by <laughs> February of 2005, I relocated across to the southeastern part of the U.S. in this little old town called Atlanta, Georgia, which yeah. is home to Coca-Cola, uh, Coca uh, the Coca-Cola company and Delta Airlines, amongst other uh, popular, well-known global companies. And I didn't look back. And eventually I started my company, Equilibria. And that's kind of what led me to where we are today. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Let's, let's let, allow you to pause for a minute. And okay. so what, what I've heard, which is incredible is you talking about your journey, your mom and dad, but then also your education and the nuns at school and the discipline that came into you, but also you had DNA discipline as well, because your mom mm. was had that eagle eye. Your father was in the air force. He would have to be disciplined. Your mom would have to be, your mother would have to be disciplined too. So you already had the makings of being that character that was going to be, you know, focused on something. And so I love that. And then the the whole corporate journey, I totally get it. You know, I've been there too. And in fact, I got out of the corporate rat race uh, in the same year that you did, 2005. Oh, and wow. I drove off from the, from, it was a Japanese company who made woven fabrics. And I was like, you know, board director, commercial, whatever, uh, sales and, and design director, whatever. And I drove off in my car, the company car, 
uh, that I would have to give back very soon. But I drove off and on my dashboard, I hadn't realized the date was July the 4th, Independence Day. Mm, yes. And I was I was driving on my own in this car and I was screaming to myself because I'd realized I would never need to go back into corporate life again. <laughs> Even mm. though, even though I didn't have a business, <laughs> uh, or was, was making you any celebrating money. your independence, celebrating my independence, yeah, hundred wow. percent to get out of the corporate. So I just wanted to share that because you mentioned two thousand and five, and that was the year that I became free, as it were, as well. And it's such a shame, though, because mm -hmm. I'm sure there are bigger companies around um, that are great for people to work for you know they you're not in silos you're not a number you're not just there to provide high profits for the board of directors uh, and big bonuses and salaries and airplanes and boats and big yachts and big houses and all of that <laughs> and amazing holidays just for the people in the top um there are there must be companies out there that are are sharing that with all of their employees, you know, recognizing them. And, but I haven't come across many, I have to say. <laughs> uh, I have to say. <laughs> they must be out there, but I don't know who they are. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're holding out hope. <laughs> yeah. If you're out there, please give us a call. Come on the podcast. Please. We'd love to interview both of on Please. both our podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> so how how so now now that you're you got out after you got your 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 business degree and went right, I've got to get out, I've got to go on my own, and then your company was born. So tell us how did the name come about what what were you, what was your idea your big idea that made you so passionate about getting going with it i love that question about the name of the company no one ever asks me that so thank you michael equilibria is really an ode to my days back in chemistry and chemical engineering and right. it's the it's the plural form of equilibrium which yes. when you are in chemistry, you, 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 you're always taught that a reaction, a chemical reaction is not stable until it has reached a point of equilibrium. Right. Basically, it's balanced itself out. And so when I started to come up with the name of the company, I started thinking, okay, what is it that, what is a word? I, I didn't want to name the company after myself, but mm. what is a word that would exude the end result or the desired yeah. result as a yes. result of us working together. And it is, you know, reaching not just a state of equilibrium, but equilibria and, you know, balance some, some sense of balance across all of it, You're not right. just in one area or one facet of the business, but across the entire business holistically. Yeah. I started off, believe it or not, as a professional organizer. Right. So I was literally going into people's closets, their home offices. I never really did anyone's kitchen. There might be a basement. Mm. But what what I discovered, at least with the people that I attracted as clients, Michael, yeah. is that the overwhelming majority of them had home offices that needed to be organized. And it wasn't because they were chronically disorganized people. They certainly were by no means hoarders. They needed processes and systems right. because, because they were working from home. It was difficult to keep things related to the house separate from things related to the business. But they just you. needed some systems in place. And so that's when I started to tap into my chemical engineering background. So for those, for your listeners, chemical engineers, we usually work, if we if we really work as, continue to work as engineers, it's usually one of two types. That's a design engineer where you're literally designing equipment to produce things at a massive scale or as a process engineer. 
And right. so, for example, Michael, when I was over at Monsanto for the part of the, the overall, the business unit that I worked in, there was a, a byproduct that we were producing and it had to meet certain specifications. And the different chemists would come over, they test, you know, if you make a batch of something, they would come over, they would test it and they would let you know, hey, this this doesn't quite, this particular batch that you just made, it doesn't quite mm. meet the specifications. So I, as the process engineer, have to go in and figure out, well, what went wrong? At what stage in this process did something yes. go wrong to yeah. make this overall batch not meet the specification? So, so keep that in mind and apply that to businesses. So I went yeah. from studying how to make chemicals flow to studying how to make work and information flow. Got you. And yeah. so I started to tap in very, very heavily on some of those core process engineering skills and apply that to these entrepreneurs, these founders, these owners of these small businesses that were that happened to be in their home. And eventually I started to, I'll never forget I had <laughs> A district attorney's office contacted me and they said, we'd, we'd like your help. And this, this goes to show you how naive I was at this time because mm. my world had been purely engineering. Engineers tend to be very organized, again, very methodical. There's a process in place for everything. And I'll never forget thinking to myself, there's disorganization in companies and Government institutions? Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so sweet of you. I know, I know, right? <laughs> me, me thinking so highly of them. Oh, you are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. But that that shows you how naive I was, and yeah. So I started doing that work, and and then I realized. After working, I remember talking to a marketing consultant, and this would have been probably back in 2007. And I started talking to her about the different types of projects that I was working on and how it was organizing. And she said, well, that's that's true. That's true. It's actually business infrastructure. Right. And I was like, oh, I like that. And so that was how the uh, official switch from, or transition, I should say, from professional organizing mm. to business infrastructure. Right. Great. Wow. Well, that's brilliant. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's a big jump, though, to go into people's home offices and go, right, let's organize your process, you know. Um, what are these files over there? Do you need them? You know, right, exactly. let's put them in the basement. You know, what are you doing with your email? How are you managing that? Or how are you structuring your files on your computer? And th there's a, it's a huge jump to go from that, which is really important and helpful for small businesses because lots of people don't know how to do it. I'm, I'm aware of that. And from that to go to business infrastructure. And how did anybody hire you <clears throat> not knowing that you had experience in the business infrastructure? If you know what I mean. I know exactly what you mean. And it explains what I'm about to say. And that okay, is great. business infrastructure is a blessing blessing and a curse, Michael. A blessing in the sense that there aren't a lot of people out there in the world who talk about business infrastructure. Mm. A curse in the sense that there aren't a lot of people out there in the world who talk about business infrastructure. In other words, people don't know to go and search for this. They know there's an issue, but they don't quite know how to articulate that. Yeah. How do you go online and search for help with I mean, what, what words do you even use? Mm. So that by and large has been, I would say, single-handedly without question, the biggest challenge that I have had in my business is just that education piece, yes. getting the word out, 
letting yeah. people know this and, and letting them also know this is not something that is confined for larger corporations or enterprises. Mm. Mm. I, I meet a lot of small business owners who think, especially when we start having conversations about processes, yeah, they think, oh, that sounds like a really big corporate word. Surely that doesn't apply for my micro enterprise. Well, actually it does. Totally. And let me show you how and why it does. Yeah. So, so you're, you're absolutely correct. It, it was a quantum leap, <laughs> mm. not just an evolution, but, but like a quantum leap going from organizing to business infrastructure. And had it not been for that corporate exposure that I had as an engineer, I don't think I would have right. been able to do it. Well, I know I would not have been able to do it. Did you, did you suffer at all from like <laughs> imposter, imposter syndrome? Like, you know, I'm not worthy to be. I hear field. that word. Yes. I've never had that issue. Truthfully, I, I've, I've never had it. I, I tell you what I do, what I, where, where it does creep up is when I'm in the middle of an engagement with a client and they may ask me, can you do this for us also? And I'm like, yeah, I can do it. <laughs> And then I go home like, oh my gosh, what have I just signed up for? Why did I say yes? <laughs> <laughs> but 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 truthfully, Michael, I I believe in myself and my abilities enough to know that I can figure it out. Yeah. And, and the if reason... something is just mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt. The reason I asked that question, because I don't know. I just felt that you didn't have that as an issue. <laughs> it's just the energy in how you speak. There's, you know, there's like almost a natural, well, yeah, of course I've gone from organizing people in the home to corporate infrastructure. And there was no mention of, you know, that transition was really tough for me. A real struggle. No, it, it no, didn't it was. No, it was. It was. No, it, it it was a struggle. It was a struggle. <laughs> but but I guess the 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 reason I can come across that way. This is the only reason why. Yeah. Having that kind of confidence is because I stay in my lane, Michael. Yeah. I stay in my lane. So oh. if someone. I know I, you know, because I certainly don't say yes to everything that I may be no. asked to do, sure. not at all. So if someone were to ask me something very, you know, about a particular technology and programming or coding something, no, I'm not, and I'm not going to try to go and and learn it. I just, I know the answer is no. I know what my limitations are, mm. and that had to come with time. Also, it it really did. It had to come with time. The, the second thing that I credited that the confidence to is listening, listening mm. to what customers tell me they want. Right. I believe that's a big part of why so many businesses fail is because we, we become in love with, as, as my friend Martina Goss, who's, who's in Ireland, always tells me, we have to fall in love with the problem and not our solution. Oh, wow. She tells me that all the time. Fall in love with your problem and not with the solution. She is yeah. a lean um, a lean startup coach. Yeah. And she's actually helping me with some things right now in my business. And that just resonated just as it's it's it struck a chord with you. It definitely struck a chord with me yeah, when she first told I it love to that. me. I love that. And it's it's really resonated and and it's so true. If, if we if I think about it, Michael, when I was first approached by that district attorney's office about going into their their place, their their organization and doing some level of organizing work, what if I, I had turned that down? Mm, what if I said, mm. well, no, that's that's not what I do, because what I do is over here in this box. Yeah. And I don't want to play outside of this box. I don't even want to explore the possibility. Right. But thankfully, I was open to the idea. It was scary. What if I fail? What if I mess up? What if I mm. say something 
that that comes across as being amateur or or you know those thoughts definitely crept up in my mind yeah. but i went for it and i saw that it wasn't as bad as i thought it was going to be and then i realized hmm i have to change some things i have to change the way i do certain things i have to change the way i describe this so again, no yes. longer professional organizing, rather business infrastructure. But I think, Michael, only because I I have remained open to listening to what my clients are saying that they really want and not forcing my ideas onto them. Right. And yeah. and just and and just staying in my lane and knowing where, where my knowing where my core competencies are and yeah. my zone of genius yeah that's the only reason I can come across so confidently yes because if I had told you oh well, you know what there was this time I did this and <laughs> oh that did not turn out well at all and it was a struggle but but even 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 with those two important factors of of being a good listener to your customers and staying in my lane there definitely have been struggles. Oh my God, there's there's still struggles to this very day. Of course, yeah. Um. So yeah. so I I I certainly don't want to come across as though. Oh yeah, I got it, and everything's everything, and no, there's no struggle. It's all been great and wonderful because that's that's not true at all. No, I, of course it isn't because you're you're a small business yourself and. Therefore, you know, we we have challenges for small business. Of course we do. And at the same time, you have this calmness about you that doesn't then unnerve the customer, <laughs> you know. So being calm, being a listener, knowing your stuff. And if you don't, yeah, you can say yes, but you'll go and find out how to do it. And get it done um it's it's really important to have that calmness and that authority of knowing almost that mm -hmm. that will then make the client customer you know at ease with you i guess yeah. could you imagine if i was you know just yeah. kind of chaotic and mm. and i'm trying to to you know and i'm going into an environment that i know is is chaotic it, you know it's it's um yeah. so thank you so much for pointing that out because that that is actually something that clients will say to me is mm. there is a sense of calm yeah. and, and tranquility and and I feel as though it's going to be okay. That's right. But yeah. 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 I, so I definitely, thank you for that. No, I can sense that too. Yeah, that's brilliant. So um, now, obviously, you're on a few years. You're, you're doing this. And what would a, this is going to be a tricky one. I don't want to say the word typical, but what kind of, projects or clients have you worked on or what are you looking to attract perhaps as well for future clients sure and projects? so when it comes to small businesses we work with companies that are established right. and the reason we prefer to work with established companies michael is because with startups trying to get them to focus or have a conversation about processes is a hard sell yeah. It is a hard sell. And it makes sense because the focus tends to be more on the marketing related activities. So things like promotion and branding and PR, publicity, mm. social media, public yeah. speaking. And it makes sense because you need to get the word out about your products and your services. Absolutely. Yes. You yeah. need to draw your customers in. But what happens, Michael, when at your you're kind of if we could just imagine a the life cycle of a quote unquote, typical business. So you go from hopefully not having enough customers to having too many, because now yeah. all of that effort that you've put into those marketing related activities, you're starting to realize a return on that investment of your yeah. time and your money. And so now you, you might have a different type of problem. You might have more demand than you can yeah. actually supply. That's our sweet spot. 
because right. it's at that point where we can go in and have a conversation about, okay, you recognize that you have more than you can handle. That usually means you need to expand your team. So let's have a conversation about that. Yeah. What work needs to be done? How is that work organized into departments? How is that work then? How do you actually do the work that you've defined? That's yeah. where processes come into play. How is your physical workspace actually set up? That's where that's an ode to the original days of the organizing. Let's let's talk about the physical layout of your workspace. And then finally, let's look at your your records management systems. Yeah. So if you even if you're organizing things mostly digitally, we all know there's a such thing as digital clutter. So let's have a conversation about that. Okay. That's our sweet spot. I also, there are also some corporate clients that we work with as well, but when the, with the corporate or larger enterprise organizations, as well as some government entities that we've worked with, they're usually focused exclusively on processes. Right. So process documentation, process yeah. optimization, a lot of times they want to introduce a new type of technology to automate some of the things that they're doing within a yeah. process. So mm. that's that's usually the types of projects that we will work on for large larger organ organizations. Great. Great. Sounds incredible. And do the the so it's it's the question that came into my head as you started talking about it, it's it's almost companies, apart from those corporate clients, but those smaller businesses where they're looking to scale and yes. scale successfully, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. So that they don't then mess up uh, on that journey. But it's it's got to be some clever, you know, chief executive officer or managing director or whatever they're called that can recognize that, that that's what they need. Right. And but then how yes. do they find you, Alicia? How do they and find that, you? That is the rub, Michael. That's the rub, which brings us back to our earlier point of, yeah, business infrastructure mm, sounds good, but people don't know to search that way. And so no. we have spent, I've worked with so many different marketing consultants and experts and digital coaches mm. over the years who've taught me how to really pay attention to the language that people are using to describe something. Yeah. And, and through search engine optimization, that is how, for example, with the company's website, we have a lot of those keywords kind of embedded in our search engine optimization efforts. A lot of times, Michael, I'm very big on writing. So I have a LinkedIn newsletter yes. now and, right. and, and I try to incorporate the language, whether it be in the title of the article, definitely yeah. within the body of the article, in the mm. things that I post on social media, the blog posts that we have. So there's this whole content marketing engine that right. is really driving this effort to increase exposure to this information so that, to your point, people know that this is an option for them. And yes. that there is help and relief because what happens, unfortunately, for so many of us who find ourselves in this situation, when we do go and search for help, we usually find one of two things. One, the information is reserved for the much bigger companies. Yes. Or it's reserved for manufacturing companies, especially yes. when you start to talk about things like Lean Six Sigma. Mm. Yeah. which is a process improvement initiative. There's no shortage of people who are certified in Lean Six Sigma, which yeah. is a process improvement framework. But asking them if they will work with a small business, no, way. it's hard to find yeah. them, Michael. It's so yeah. hard to find them. And so this is where I'm, I am, I and my team, we are working round the clock to change that narrative and to put business infrastructure, you know, forget my company, Equilibria. Let's just do our part to put business infrastructure on the map. 
Yeah. So that these owners and founders and managers and leaders of these smaller businesses and micro enterprises know that there is help, there is support specifically for them mm. and mm. their very unique needs, because we do have unique challenges that larger organizations simply don't have. Mm. But our bigger advantage is that we can use that small size. We have a, a type of agility that they yes. don't have and we can make decisions a lot quicker and we can, we can be a lot more nimble yeah, um, in comparison 100%. to those much larger organizations. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> Sounds incredible. And I almost feel like there needs to be a business infrastructure school you know, that people can oh, go to. Speaking of which, mm. Michael, oh my gosh, are you, you in our, are you in my head? That's exactly what we're working on right now. Brilliant. That is exactly what we're working on. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. It just makes sense, doesn't it? People need That's to be exactly educated. That's exactly what we're working yeah. on. Fabulous, mm -hmm. fabulous. So tell us, how can people get in touch with you when they, you know, need this kind of help, Alicia? The best way is to, if you want to connect with me personally, the best way is through my website, my personal website, which is aliciabutlerpierre.com. If you want to know more about business infrastructure and this course that Michael has conjured up, Thank you again for that plug, Michael. <laughs> I did not know about this at all. And I and I want you. I'm I'm curious to hear your your. Um, I I want to see and hear your reaction when I tell you the name of it. It is called mm. the Smooth Operator. Oh, I love it. And <laughs> and so, if your listeners and people who are watching us right now on YouTube, if you go to Smooth Operator dot courses, and that is with an S at the end you can find out all about the course on business right. infrastructure. That's brilliant. Oh, well done. That's fantastic. Thank you. And that means so much to me coming from you. I really appreciate that. Oh, this is no problem at all. I, I, obviously, one of the things that you're getting the message out to is being on this podcast and being interviewed on podcasts. So tell us also about your podcast that you do. Sure. It's called the Business Infrastructure Curing Back Office Blues Podcast. And you're going to love this, Michael. And please, please accept my offer to come onto my show. Okay. It is a storytelling format now. Yes, I as love of, it. As of, last, as of last year, we literally switched over to more of a storytelling format. But yeah. we have an amazing group of different entrepreneurs, executives, and experts who come on and literally give us a behind the scenes look at what they do and how they help the companies or the individuals that they work with. So it's it's really looking at, okay, we have these back office operational things that are going on, help what are the tools and technologies that that are out there that can help me streamline some of the things that yeah. I'm doing? Right. Is there a, a certain process that you recommend? Who are the types of people that you hire? Where do you suggest I go to find those people? Yeah. Those are the kinds of conversations that we have. Wonderful. Oh, well done. Well done. That's amazing. I love talking to another podcaster always. <laughs> <laughs> Alicia, thank you so much for your time. We could spend another 30 minutes talking oh, about this. Absolutely. And that's why you have to come <laughs> on to my show. <laughs> but we, we want to leave the listeners wanting more. And the only way they can get more is to get in touch with you, right? Yes, indeed. <laughs> so check out Alicia via her website or via LinkedIn or uh, via the, the, the courses website. And it's just been a real pleasure talking to you today. Thank you so oh, much for coming on. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. You are a breath of fresh air. Thank you, Michael. Okay, brilliant. Keep in touch, Alicia. I love to see how it all goes. Take care for thank now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. 
you can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.